Okay, welcome to the Stratcom podcast. I'm Omer Kablan. I'm a presenter at TRT World. I host a show called Double Check. Now, today we're going to be speaking to John Biggs, who's an entrepreneur, consultant, writer, and he spent many years editing for Gizmodo, Crunchgear, and TechCrunch, and has a deep background in hardware startups, 3D printing, and blockchain. Thanks for joining us, John. It's a pleasure to have you. Howdy. John, I just want to get your expertise on a few topics now. The Stratcom Summit is about strategic communications. Now, first of all, of course, one very important aspect uh, these days is startup companies. Can you basically explain to us what a startup company is and what are some of the factors for it to be successful? Uh, I mean, I would define a startup as a, a small business with global ambition. So the goal there is that it's a business that's built to scale. First off, it can be built anywhere in the world. And the goal is to expand outside of your geographical location or do something that expands outside of, I don't know, your traditional comfort zone. If, you're, if you come from a place that's not really highly technical, then you kind of, you kind of ex- expand into something very technical. Which I've seen many, many times in many, many places. And what do you mean by technical exactly? Can you open that up a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I guess you would. I guess the, the way I would explain it is, uh, is if you're, if the family that you come from, or the town you come from, or the city you come from, is traditionally, I don't know, merchant based, or you guys are importing, exporting, that kind of stuff, and you do something completely different. I think one of the best examples was uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Where the where I visited a few years ago now, uh, the entire industry, all the industries there were basically hospitality. It's just basically if you work there, you're in a hotel. You work at a hotel, and I met some entrepreneurs there who were building small businesses with global with global uh, with the intention of building building them out globally, and they were they weren't businesses that were traditionally expected in Trinidad and Tobago. They didn't have anything to do with uh, hospitality. Maybe they were cop clones of successful businesses outside of Trinidad and Tobago, something like a Yelp or something like that. But for all intents and purposes, they were rebuilding those things for, for a wider audience. So I guess that's the, way to, that's the way I think about it. And John, so one aspect of all of this is, of course, trying to reach that audience you speak about. And the most important tool for that is to be able to communicate effectively with them. So in particular with startups, what are some of the tools that are necessary for, for building that communication process? I mean, I think the tools are a, an understanding that you absolutely have to communicate outside of your zone. If you're a Turkish company or if you're a I don't know, Polish company or something like that, if you're only focused on your own market, then you're basically not a global startup and you really can't scale. So communication is as important as, I don't know, building out your software to be massively scalable. Communication is as important as making sure that you're hiring the right people to interact with customers. The that sort of thing is of vital importance when it comes to when it comes to building out a business. Okay. And I also want to talk a little bit about 3D printing. Now we've heard of this over the last several years. At one stage we said it's going to be it's going to change a lot of things, but it's still not very prevalent in society. Um, so what is 3d printing and where do you see the future for, for 3d printing? Yeah. I mean, I guess we're really into 3d printing, uh, for almost half a decade ago. I think now everybody really was, it was kind of like the future. It was going to be the greatest thing ever. It wasn't it now, uh, unfortunately the, the, where it stopped is that we only got to a certain point in terms of, uh, in terms of the viability and usability of uh, 3d prints. And if you're not familiar with 3d printing is essentially just like, uh, It's the equivalent of like a regular printer that just spits out plastic and it goes back and forth over a platform and just creates plastic. Right. Uh, And you can, you can use it to, you can use it to make little doodads around the house. I literally have, let's see, four or five 3d printed objects or things that actually, no, actually many more because I have a collection of star Wars toys and I, and I printed little, uh, little stands for these guys. Now, obviously, not everybody needs this by any stretch of the imagination, but the fact that I could basically print a custom item, I have a headphone holder for myself here uh, that I 3D printed myself. I can print a custom item 
have it have it work instantly and have it in my home instantly is kind of a big deal. It's just not uh, it's just not uh, compelling enough for a mass audience yet. But do you think it will be someday? I think if it I think if it's a little bit faster and a little bit less wonky. Right now it's really loud and annoying. Uh, it's very similar to like printing a printing a banner uh, back in the old days if you used to print a banner on a, on a dot matrix printer it would just make that awful buzzing noise when we were kids that was great because hey we're we're making a banner for mom when she comes home or something like that but now it's almost it's completely ridiculous if we expect that to, that to be the case so it's kind of in that kind of in that mode unfortunately it's taken a lot longer than I would say like laser printing has taken to really amp up and hit the next next level of development. Mm -hmm. I saw somewhere they put, uh, they 3D printed some houses on an island or something like that. So they're doing some mass scale 3D printing, but I think it's still way too expensive to, to invest in for a lot of people. Yeah, I think the, I think the way to think about those things are those are nice uh, proof of concepts, but the fact is, is you still need a you still need a massive system to do that, and it's far cheaper just to buy some plywood and some concrete and just slap it up. It doesn't really make any sense to like really go go nuts with a with a, a thing that squirts out concrete in a perfect line when all you have to do is just lay the concrete. Mm -hmm. And it's way cheaper to hire somebody to do that as opposed to uh, as opposed to uh, waste your waste your money and, and time on something like that. <laughs> Absolutely. So, John, let's also talk about blockchain. So, everywhere we go now, people are, you know, on their phones looking at the cryptocurrency rates. So, where do you see all of this going? Is this something that's just going to grow more and more? I think so. I, I equate I equate crypto with the web circa say 1998. It wasn't even that uh, exciting back then. Nobody really knew how it was working. We we really weren't hitting the right the right things. Unfortunately, unlike the web, unlike the the, the browser based web, the, the normal human being, and I would I would equate us with being the normal human beings, don't really understand what the what the benefit of a lot of this stuff is yet. Back in the olden days, two thousand, you had pets dot com. You knew you could order pet food for your dog, and it would come in the mail, and that was kind of a big deal. Like you used to have to go to a pet store, you used to have to walk down the street, all this other stuff. And all of a sudden, you don't have to do that anymore. That's great. Mm. But in this case, we're in this world where the utility of blockchain-based tools is fairly limited. And it's even more limited by the fact that the people who are kind of pushing it the most are the biggest hucksters in the space. Mm. So it would be similar to if, I don't know, Jeff Bezos were like telling us that in the future, we're all going to be flying with jetpacks. And that's all he told us. It's not like he told us that we're going to get books in the mail. No, instead he says the the Amazon is designed specifically to give jetpacks to everybody in the world, and it was to, and every year he just keeps saying jetpacks and nobody's really and there's no no jetpacks showing up, right? So we're in this exact same position where the biggest proponents of it are the ones who are lying to us the most. Unfortunately, I think it's going to I think it's going to get better slowly but surely, but it's not quite there yet. You know. Sometimes I see people that are very uh, involved with cryptocurrency. So obviously it's mostly just like ordinary folk who have ordinary jobs. But, you know, when you meet up with them, they consistently follow this on their phones, you know, and they get happy when a certain cryptocurrency goes up and they always leave their money inside. So basically I always feel like, where is the money actually? Where? Well, I mean, if you think if you think about it, if so, if anybody's anybody you know has been in cryptocurrency so for for any length of time, that they've definitely made money. So, and it, I mean, in a bull market, everybody's a genius. In a bear market, everybody's mm -hmm. a moron. Right now, everybody's a moron because it's kind of a bear market. But you're going to be talking to people who who aren't going to pull their money out. First off, maybe they maybe they've made so much money that it doesn't really matter to them. They can pull. They've already pulled out their mm -hmm. profits. And if they haven't, then they just want to hold on to it and just wait and see if they can keep going. So, John, are you are you an investor in cryptocurrency? Own some since way back when. I follow the market pretty closely, and I see how it works. And for all intents and purposes, it's kind of a it's kind of a scam, but it's it's our scam. So I guess we should enjoy it. Okay, and John, tell us what you're writing about these days. What's some of the important topics you like writing about? 
Uh, right now, I'm talking about alt investments, alternative investments for a site called Vincent with Vincent.com. It's a lot of fun. It's the idea that you can invest fractionally in things like comic books or video games or NFTs, that sort of thing. And uh, it's been uh, it's been an interesting ride. Some of the stuff that we find is like I don't know an Obi Wan Kenobi toy from 1977 that sold for like six figures. It's just completely ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And I wish I'd kept mine in a in a box somewhere instead of opening it. But I guess that's the that's the price you got to pay. Okay, so alt investments and mm-hmm. do these include anything else? What else was it? What what else is an alternative investment? Like startup investments, reg CF crowdfunding investments. You could also say like wine. You could say uh, you could say sports cards, real estate, that kind of stuff. Anything that's anything that's not an equity, really. And uh, you know, on your Twitter handle and also on your webpage, you also refer to yourself as a maker. What, what mm-hmm. does that mean? I do a little coding, and mm-hmm. I also do. I also play with electronics, but not very well. I mean, I basically I have a background in information systems, so I went to Carnegie Mellon for information systems. So I know how to program. So one of the things that I made was called Tech for Reporters, which is a way for reporters to ask hard questions about technology. Okay. And John, so are you these days, when you look at all of the, the things you're talking about in terms of technology, what you research, what you write about, where do you see this technological leap heading? Do you, do you think the more and more technology evolves, it's kind of looking like a bleaker future or this is kind of an optimistic thing for you? No, I think my view is that we're heading towards techno utopia. It's not going to be a super utopia, but I think Technology fixes a lot of the ills associated with almost everything. I would say that technology is is going to help us with our health. It's going to help us with our diets. It's going to help us with our human interaction, that kind of stuff. So I think we're in this. I think we're in a world where we see technology as a as a net negative. I mean, let's say social media. Social media is complete garbage. But what it's done is it's basically shrunk. It's shrunk a lot of things down in a way that is not immediately apparent. The mm-hmm. fact is, is you and I are talking right now and you're, you're overseas and I'm here in the States and we're, and you can instantly get in touch with me. Uh, you can figure out who I am based on my social media, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's a value. It's, it's a net value. I know it's difficult for us to grasp right now because uh, we're really close to it. Uh, but I eventually I see, I see a lot of the technology is essentially saving our lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was this thing I read from a French writer recently, and he was criticizing all of the social media applications that are coming out. And he said, you know, these days there's a million ways to communicate except communication itself. And he was referring to how, you know, all of these social media applications are actually trying to connect people from all around the world, but they're kind of making us more individualistic, egoistic, very selfish, very individual-like um, and it's kind of killing well, our social life. No, well, I mean, look, everybody, everybody is an online commenter now. Uh, it used to be that the, the worst of the worst of the worst of people were online commenters. Now everybody's an online commenter. So we're all in this, we're all in this mode where everything we see is implicitly uh, negative, I think you could say. So we all make jokes about it. And we all like, we dunk on each other and also other stupid stuff. And we wouldn't do that if we were in real life. We wouldn't do that if we were sitting across from each other. I wouldn't be making fun of you in, in any real way. But online, we're like making fun of each other all the time. So that becomes that slowly but surely becomes increases partisanship. It increases uh, it increases argumentativeness. It increases the uh, the echo chamber because we don't want to be dunked on, right? For our beliefs, we don't want to be made fun of for thinking that uh, that something is right and something is wrong. And so we create an echo chamber for ourselves and we hide in that echo chamber. And anybody who doesn't agree with us is considered a moron. And that is a, I would argue that's a paleolithic attitude, a tribalism that will eventually be bred out of us over time. Humans are, the arc of, the arc of history uh, is long and it bends, through, it bends towards justice, right? I think that same thing is true for, for humanity. It's not true of us right now, but with our weird monkey minds, uh, but it will be true of us over the next, uh, over the next couple of decades, next century. John Biggs, thanks so much for your contribution to some of these important issues.
Thanks for joining the Stratcom podcast. All right. Thanks.